Thank you for joining me in the sandbox. I'm April Dawn Patterson, and I invite you to play with me and my guest today, Nancy Hillman. Welcome back, Nancy. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you again. Great to see you. Well, in this segment, we pop into a virtual coffee house before hitting the beach wow. and being the benevolent host that I am, your order's on me. So what order do you give the barista? Oh, thank you so much, April. You know, I'm going to have a mushroom coffee because I'm now going beyond eliminating inflammatory foods and I'm now incorporating anti-inflammatory foods. So I'm kind of obsessed with mushrooms. So I'm drinking them. Well, same with me. I'm drinking a cacao with reishi mushrooms. Nice. So it is pretty good. I love the mushroom synchronicity. That's that's a great way to start. All right. Lafayette. You already answered this question when you first came on the, the podcast, but for those who are new listeners, in your spotlight moments, have there been any claims to fame, times that our listeners have seen you or your work? Well, the the only claim to fame I've been thinking about lately is on the horizon and it's as a published author, I'm bursting and, and that's what inspired this get together. People would see my work in 14 states so far because I paint public murals. I do a lot of retaining wall murals, especially since the pandemic, but I've been doing that for 30 years. So if you live in Cincinnati, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, but mostly the Cincinnati area and the DC, Maryland area, you might see some of my murals. Lovely. And then of course, when you were on the podcast, the first time we were talking about the astral play dates, are you still available to do those? I love them. Nothing makes me happier. Although I realize as I say that, that there are several things in my life that I say nothing makes me happier <laughs> because I'm um, at this wonderful place in my life where I've, I've really curated a joyful life. And the astral play dates are how we met. They're how I met my web designer, who I was telling you about earlier. And I feel like the community I found from it and the insight that I've gained as a client have enriched my life so much the last three years. So I do share it whenever, whenever I'm asked. It's a tricky thing to offer. And one of the things I'm hoping will come out of being a published author is that I do refer to these experiences in my memoir. And, you know, as well as I do, this is not an easy thing to advertise. You don't want to suggest, you don't even, you don't want to push it on somebody, but it's awkward to suggest that you put somebody into a trance. Hey, why don't we get together and I'll put you into a trance. So if it comes up in conversation naturally, I'm excited to make that connection and to have that experience, but it is tricky. Don't you agree? Yes. When I first came to the hypnosis scene, I had reservations, how unconscious I would be and how vulnerable I'd be making myself to someone else. But it wasn't like that at all. I no. you know, maintained consciousness the entire time. It was just like a really deep meditative guided meditation experience. And it was really cool. And I've enjoyed a number of those hypnosis sessions. So... Yeah. I love it. I have friends who offered to me. And then I also have a friend I'm seeing tomorrow for an Akashic records reading, which I'm excited about. And I have not trained to do that. And I don't know if I ever will, but I have a barter situation with her where I'll do an astral play date with her and then we'll schedule an Akashic records reading. Oh, for me cool. That's cool. That <laughs> You're yeah. familiar with it? With the Akashic Records, yeah. yes, I I actually offer or did offer that as a service on my website. So oh, cool. yes, sometimes when I'm really struggling with a topic or an issue that I just can't, yeah, it just keeps circling back oh. around. I'll read the Akashic Records for myself and it's amazing what comes through and you're like, oh yeah, this is definitely not me. <laughs> this is some type of higher wisdom that's that's coming through. So yeah. 
That's so crazy. valuable. That's very cool, April. Good for you. Yeah. I don't access them very often because it is kind of time intensive. You know, you really do need to carve out the time where you're not going to be interrupted and kind of clear the space energetically. And yeah, I don't know. I I haven't made the time. I know we make time for the things that are important to us. (laughs) And for for the people who ask us to it rather than for ourselves, right? So what One of the things I have come to appreciate so deeply about astral playdates or whatever everyone calls it something different, but soul empowered hypnosis is that I've learned that the content we receive is curated for both people who have paired up for the session. Definitely. So what a great way to treat yourself while ostensibly being of service to your friend or your client, right? So you're setting aside aside time, they're giving you money or some other exchange uh, of value. But the session is full of wisdom. They're speaking what they're learning from their ascended masters, their ancestors, their spirit guides, but it's absolutely applicable to my life as the practitioner. And I'm just sitting here sometimes crying from the gratitude of how perfectly it's speaking to what I'm dealing with. So if that works in Akashic Records, then offer it to your friends because it's the gift that pays you back. Mm, Definitely. And then also I have found that to be true for dream circles. So there's a dream circle, a very trusted group of people. We have a telegram group and people will post dreams. And people have talked about... Even if they can't remember their dreams, there's no recall there. They find the group invaluable because not only are they mesmerized by the, the kinds of dreams that come through when they themselves don't experience it, the message, even though it's for the dreamer, ends up being for everyone within the group. And it's kind of like you're dreaming for, for the rest. (laughs) Yeah. It's really, it's really cool. Well, I had a classic anxiety dream this morning about going back to high school. So absurd. I just, just, (laughs) but yeah, there are some dreams that are lovely to share. And I did share this one on Facebook because I think, wow, it's so classic. Let's have a talk about the fact that we're in the second half of our lives, many of us, and we're still in high school in our dreams. Mm -hmm. And when will it end? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, dreams can be very cool. Well, so that I give you enough time to incorporate your linguistic tag word, let's go into that. (laughs) Guests are asked to choose a word or phrase that they would like to hear used more often in everyday conversation, something that doesn't get enough play or enough airtime. And the prior guest chose abyss. (laughs) So you are tasked to try to somehow fit that into our conversation today. (laughs) now you also get to choose the next stump the next guest that's not that's not nice okay now you also get to choose a word for the next guest to dance with and it could be a peculiar word that you find funny or something that's just resonating with you now so what are you laying down if they do not know the word will you tell them what it is can you can you help them out Yes, we will tell them. Often we'll stop the whole conversation and we will look up the definition. Okay. All right. So I think I want to invite the next guest to discuss mycelium with you. Okay. Love it. We're drinking our mushroom drinks. (laughs) Yeah. Cheers. (laughs) Okay. Now, just for grins, I went back to see what your first word had been what word you had chosen on your first appearance on the podcast. And it was the word symbiotic. And that was well, back that's, on, that's great. yeah, that episode released January 24th of 2021. So it's yeah. been a little while. <laughs> it's been a while. And I, I'm guessing it was because we were discussing astral playdates and what we were just talking about, about how it, you know, benefits both the client and the practitioner. Mm-hmm. Wild guess but probably 
Well, do you mind if I draw tarot card or let me give you an option. I have a tarot, a new tarot deck that I'm really digging, Great. or we can choose a card from Caroline Mises archetype deck. So do you have a preference? Let's, do, let's do an archetype. Okay, cool. All right. That's a thick stack. <laughs> a lot of cards in this one. Okay. I'm sending my energy into your deck. Do it. Okay. Yes. So let's ask the question of like, what archetype are we needing to explore or bring in in some aspect in this conversation today? <laughs> All right, let's see. And it is storyteller. You cannot make this stuff up. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it's the ability to experience and express life through stories and symbols. I cannot. <laughs> I'm telling you, I did not set that up. It's so fun, April. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Okay, nice. Yes. Uh, I'll have to okay. post this after the, the podcast goes live. I'll post that on the oh, social media. You are indeed magical. There's the proof. Oh, goodness. In, le in case there was any doubt. <laughs> well, it's great for me because I'm not going to have to stretch myself in any way for us to bring this in. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's what correct. That's yeah. the reason why we brought you on. Let's mm -hmm. talk about your book. When are we able to read or listen to this book of yours? Very soon. So I know that it'll take a little time before this conversation is made public, but I know that our fellow soul empowered hyp hypnosis enthusiast has promised to add the pre-order page to my website by October 15th. Okay. So it should be able to be pre-ordered by then and you'll get a discounted price and you'll get an autograph. Um, I will personally mail it to you if you pre-order. So you'll save money and have a doodle and my signature. So mm -hmm. someday when I'm a famous author, not just a published author, the value of your book will increase. When you said that, I think I have a handmade note from you from one of our play dates. <laughs> yes, look, <laughs> I have certain letters that are meaningful to me. That is so sweet. Did I dip? Yes, I dipped it. <laughs> yeah, so that was really, really sweet. Anything that's like kind of important no, I, really touch. or I do. I keep, I keep those all on my kitchen window. So I see them every morning. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just the envelopes like that, that you see the envelope, but you know what's in it. And it just makes you feel good to see the envelope. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah. so nice. What is the title of your book? And how oh. long did it take you to come up with the title? First of all, the title is Instigator of Joy, Becoming My Own Fairy Godmother. The thing about this is I started writing it 17 years ago. And the version that I was writing 17 years ago, ago was called Princess in Recovery. And I know this because a journalist came to my house, interviewed me about something else, but found out I was writing a memoir and mentioned that I was writing a memoir. Everyone should look for it. <laughs> and she said the You've title- been looking for a while. <laughs> Everyone look for this book, Princess in Recovery. And- I came across it recently because I was trying to figure out how many years ago that happened. So I was doing a Google search and I said to my editor, this is stunning to me because I've been talking to her about the timing and the many versions and the, all the work and all the giving up and putting it in a drawer and starting over again and how I have come to the writing as a different person each time. And the story is clearly different each time. The themes of princess and fairy godmother and um, the influence of fairy tales on my psyche as a young child is always there. But I was just blown away to realize that the title changed with me and I did my recovery work that was informed by all these drafts of my memoir, excavating memory and healing myself. 
and in the process, transforming myself from the princess in the tower to the mature woman who discovered and owns and harnesses transformative magic. And I was so excited. I still am. I just think it's the coolest thing. Like, I'm so thankful that I didn't publish the princess version. And I wrote it to inform myself and to become more conscious, to inform my life from then until now. So that's a very long answer, but it's so important to me to share that. At what point did you get the idea that your story was one worth telling? And let me say that I think that everyone has a story that is worthwhile, definitely. And by us sharing our stories with one another and the generations to come, I think that it's a lost art for one thing is that of the storyteller. But I think there are often a couple of different groups of people. There are the people who would not mind writing a memoir, but they just don't think that their life was exciting enough to write about. No one would want to read it. Or then you have these people who live these amazing, crazy lives and people tell them you should write a book, but they're too busy living or they're just not writers or readers that's even on their radar. So it's it's kind of a magical combination when you have someone who has both experienced some really amazing, not your run of the mill things and is willing to write about it. So did people just tell you, hey, you should write a book about this or what? Okay. Let's see if I can give you an organized response. I have a lot to say about this. The main answer is that I have been told repeatedly by the main psychic spiritual advisor who came into my life when I was in my 20s and who left this earth late 2021. She told me from the time she met me that I was going to write a book. And she wasn't the only psychic to tell me that, but she pestered me. So she would ask me, but with no awareness that she asked me before because she's just channeling. They're saying you're going to write a book or they're telling me to remind you something. You're writing a book. I'd be like, oh my God, seriously, <laughs> this, this again, this again. So there were many years that I didn't speak to her. I actually dedicated my book to her. Miriam was not well when I moved here 10 years ago. And she had been giving me the message over and over again that I had completed some classes in this life and I was sort of plateauing. Anyway, when I rediscovered Miriam when she was 86, I thought she I thought she was already dead, but she surprised me by not having an obituary. I was <laughs> looking for her obituary, found her and one of the things she said in our reunion conversation was, did you write that book yet? I got really defensive and told her I had hired a coach and I had an outline and I had covered my walls with post-it notes. And the whole thing was such an ordeal and costly and all the other excuses. She kind of laughed and said, if it's that complicated, you're doing it wrong. If you could just simply tell your story to help one person. That's all I'm asking you to do. And if you do help that one person, it will be worth all your trouble. Mm -hmm. And it was so clear that she's like, I am giving you this message. What am I doing wrong? Okay. Let me, you know, she, she just boiled it down and I got it that this was not her opinion because yeah, people say that to me at parties. If I tell a crazy story, they're like, oh man, you have to write a book. This is completely different. This is an instruction from on high. So she was a devoutly Christian woman. I'm Jewish. It was interesting because, I mean, we're all talking about stuff from the same source. I realize that. But it it's so Jewish to say, to save one life, it's worth, it's as if you save the world. Like 
do, do anything, break any law, you know, whatever you have to do to save a life, just do it. It felt like she was saying that. And so that's how I got to write the book. And that's how I got to stay in my seat. I have serious ants in my pants, always have. It was painful to sit still for that long. But there was no way out of this continuous instruction except to write the damn thing. So there you have there you have it. You can edit that however you like. And in terms of other people, I don't think you have to have a fascinating or amazing life to have a worthwhile story. There are two reasons to write your story. One, shame is one of the worst forces in the world. And its antidote is telling your story, or I should say its its cause is silence. So shame grows in silence. And when you speak your story, I know this from personal experience, if you can find a sympathetic listener, your shame evaporates. When you're heard sympathetically and your situation is normalized and you realize that you're not to blame, that changes your life. So that's a reason to tell your story is because it will change your life. And what was the other point? Maybe that was it. If you help somebody recognize themselves in your story, then you're sparking healing for them. And that's really what I'm trying to do. Because I've already broken my silence, but I want people to recognize themselves in me and be more loving to themselves. Okay, so what came to me as you were saying that is that even though maybe even externally there hasn't been anything bizarre or maybe something that you consider worth telling a story about, everyone has an internal experience that's worth talking about and telling. Yes, yes. right. we're all struggling. Yeah. That's the nature of being human. Mm -hmm. And in our struggle, we tend to blame ourselves and be very hard on ourselves and lack compassion for ourselves. So finding an audience and discussing with one reader what you went through I, I hope that people will find compassion for themselves by writing. And also if they're blessed to have an editor like mine, she's an absolute angel, always had the right, perfect thing to say to me. So if my therapist is listening to this, hopefully she won't. I feel like my editor is my best therapist <laughs> because she is looking at this really raw stuff. She's looking at raw material and her response to, to, to it has felt so powerfully loving and healing to me. My therapist is also great. Um, I need them both. We all, you know, that's the other thing is that we, we all really need support. If it's a writing community, a loving writing community, like I found in Cincinnati at Women Writing for a Change, you can create your own. I saw a friend posting on Facebook that she's going to host little short burst memoir writing circles. Hmm. It's that's very cool. All right. So I have two two questions going off of that. You mentioned having ants in your pants and just never being able to sit down. So for those people who resonate and relate to that, what did you actually do? What did you put into place to make yourself sit down? Did you like say 10 minutes a day or what kind of rules did you place for yourself to make sure it got done finally? I sent a bunch of money to somebody and then she expected to see a certain number of pages or words for our next meeting that was really I put the financial screws to myself and I've told other writers this and they were like yeah whether it's an MFA program or a, a work a writing workshop or a book coach or an editor when you pay someone money to read the pages that you're about to produce you produce those pages. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. True. It brings up something I had talked about in another podcast with a guest. We were talking about the benefits of therapy and it came up, well, why don't people just write down their thoughts and carve out this time for themselves instead of spending the money in therapy, right? And the thing is, is that 
maybe because there isn't any money on the line, there's no skin in the game. And so you, you don't protect that time. You end up not doing all of the mental health stuff that you know you should do. But whenever you put money there, you actually go visit someone or you're logging online to see a therapist, then it makes all the difference because not only are you having someone there to witness and help nudge you along in the right direction, but there's an investment there of yourself and that's worth protecting. And that's why you will continue to put more of your energy towards that thing because there's more of you that's motivated to see it work, to make it do the most good that it can. Yeah. People find that with uh, coaches as well. I haven't worked with a personal coach or an executive coach, but some of them say, I'm going to charge you a lot of money, but I, but I know you're going to make it worthwhile. You're investing this much. So now you have to fulfill all the dreams that you're investing along with it. Mm -hmm. But I just have to say, I, my therapist is doing a lot more than listening to me talk for an hour. I would not pay for that. I, I can do that with my best friend. My best friend is not my therapist. I talk to her. She calls it the podcast because she's usually half asleep and she's driving to work and I just talk and talk and talk. And then and I was like, and that's today's podcast, but it's more than a podcast to my therapist. She is older and wiser, first of all, which, you know, fewer and fewer people are the older and wiser I get. So that's valuable. And the flip side of that coin is she challenges me. She interrupts me, which a lot of people will not do because I'm very forceful and authoritative when I say something and it's inti apparently intimidating to friends and certain spouse people. So this therapist will just be like, excuse me, if you don't mind, let me just say something like this is fine, but hold on a second. She says that all the time. So it's the interruptions and the challenges that make it valuable, not hearing myself speak. But with writing the book, the money made all the difference. And I didn't have a regular schedule, but I did block time off because I'd have this meeting coming up and I'd be like, okay, I have two hours I can do there and one hour here, three hours this other day. So I would mark them off on my calendar. And that was helpful too. Mm. Yeah, not only do you have this big energy, but you have a rather Im imposing presence physically as well. You're a taller lady, um, aren't you? <laughs> a tall lady, but not on the phone. I'm not physically <laughs> present on the phone. Apparently my tone of voice is strident, forceful. These are some words <laughs> I've heard. I mean, I, I do put a lot of energy and emotion behind a lot of things I express. But if listeners can't get enough after today's episode, they can rest assured that this new book, Investigator of Joy, is also going to be available as an audio book. Instigator. instigator. Sorry for over talking. Oh, instigator. Yeah. I'm sorry. I wrote, I wrote it down, yeah. Instigator, and I completely read it wrong. I am hoping that I can help you, the reader, instigate joy for yourself and for others. I'm doing both of those things. And I guess I'm investigating how I came to be this way because that's that's the thing people have said over and over again, not write a book, but how did you get to be fill in the blank? They see what I'm doing. Like I'm painting a retaining wall and I'm having a lot of fun in my life. And they're like, how'd you get this job? How did you create this career? Where did you come from? Were you born from a flower like the ones de uh, described by April? No, no. And then I, I came out as an instigator of joy to my classmates at my recent college reunion. And they were really confused. Like, well, how did this happen? Because we remember you from way back when, when you were sitting in the dining hall in your pajamas for several days, eating ice cream endlessly because you were getting kicked out of school. And you seem like the happiest person in the room right now. So how'd you get here? So I did promise I would write it all down and explain. 
just to help you out here from their perspective were you in an abyss of sorts <laughs> i totally forgot about abyss i was in an abyss i was just sliding down the icy precipice into the abyss when they saw me eating ice cream from a bottomless bowl in my pajamas in the dining hall in January, 1985, I was in the abyss for a year, the abyss of shame, loneliness, isolation, lack of purpose. I was required to withdraw from college for a year and I was not allowed to tell anyone that. And I was not allowed to see mental health professional. So that was my temporary, fortunately, temporary abyss. And yet it was not rock bottom because every abyss has a rock bottom, does it not? So I had to dig or slide a bit deeper before I hit rock bottom. But that is the magical place, as I say in my book, the magical place where if you shatter, you are open and it is not a place to dwell, but a place to clamber out of. So climb out of that abyss and I will show you how I did it and hopefully inspire you to do the same. Yeah. When you say college, it's okay to, to name drop here. It wasn't just any, any college. <laughs> you know, people say that if you meet a Harvard graduate, you'll know right away because they can't wait to tell you that is not true. <laughs> and it is it is the unfortunate result of the one person, the one obnoxious Harvard graduate they met that was so proud of themselves for having graduated from Harvard. Yeah, that's where I went to college. Oh, I just wanted to make a point with that, Nancy, as far as you were talking about everyone has a story and everyone has internal experiences. So it doesn't matter how pretty or prestigious the wrapping where the outward container is it could just be college right it could or just Harvard. be college yeah <laughs> it's well what did mr rogers say it's not what you have in this life it's what you do with what you have so <laughs> i was born into privilege and you know nobody uh, gets to harvard without some degree of privilege whether they're first generation or 10th but I think there are 10 generations of graduates now, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything about the quality of a person or their life. It's, it's your life to create. So oh, I am super thrilled. Let me just say that you brought in a Mr. Rogers quote. Um, I'm thinking, my first to, therapist. I'm thinking to myself, if I should not have every guest bring at least one Mr. Rogers quote. <laughs> oh, please every, do. Please every do. Interview. I love that. I love that addition. Yeah. I quote him along with, let's see, who do I quote? The first page of my book, some of my favorite people. So I, I quote Buddha and the Talmud. That's not a person, but ancient Jewish wisdom and the novelist known as George Eliot and the lyricist of Avenue Q along with Fred, Ro Fred Rogers. That's my lineup of luminaries on the front page. Oh, yeah. my on my wish list on Etsy, there's this uh, T-shirt where it has uh, Saint Fred, uh, so it has his his head there, and then are all around him are different quotes of his. It's an amazing shirt. I, I totally want to get that. Okay, so I told you about one of the questions that had come up earlier. The other one was, how did you decide what route to go once you did? say, okay, I've taken this seriously. How did you know that you needed to go the route with an editor versus self-publishing, doing the whole thing on your own? Okay. I am self-publishing. I am the publisher of my book. Okay. But I advise anyone who wants to be a self-published author, which I, I mean, I haven't finished being one, but I recommend it. I chose, I did not look for an agent or a publisher I really wanted to do this myself and that's for creative freedom and also economics, because if you work with a publisher these days, you're going to have to create and devise the marketing plan and do a lot of legwork, but you're going to get eight to 12% of the proceeds of every book. 
So if you're going to have to do all the work anyway, why, I don't know. You can, you can hire your own people to do the things. So one of the things that you should do is hire an editor, especially if you're writing a memoir, because you can't edit your own life. You know what you did, but you don't know what other people want to hear. Mm -hmm. You, you didn't live a theme. You lived a life. You lived stories and memories you have. And I sat down to try to write all the stories that illustrate how I was cut off from joy or cut myself off from joy and all the stories that show how I found my way, my way back to joy and how I've become an instigator of joy. So that's great. They, they could only be in the book if they fit into one of those categories, but still you can't edit your stories well. So please, just like I tell lawyers, I have a lot of lawyer friends, don't represent yourself as a lawyer. That's not a good idea. Who's the famous person who said, was it Shakespeare? A, a lawyer represents himself as a fool for a client. So a writer who edits themselves has a fool for a client and just hire an editor. Okay, that's the first piece of advice to writers listening to this. Second, have someone design the book because reading a book with your eyeballs is an aesthetic experience. And there are people who do this well. You don't know how to do this. If you learned how to do it, great. You already know you're you're professionally trained. So you just saved yourself some money. But if you want people to read your book, then it has to be pleasant. So you need an editor and you need a designer or it won't be pleasant. I have Harvard classmates who have self-published, like I'm self-publishing, but as soon as I open their book, I know that they have not hired an editor or a designer because they know they're smart. And so they think that they're going to do a good job, but I just don't think it's possible. So as you're talking about lawyers, is, is that your background? Is an uh, attorney? Maybe a little bit. A little bit. I think, I think you are an attorney or were. If, if... I, I was briefly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's one of the things about your life from the glimpses that I've seen is that you're always surprising to me with this little tidbit or I'll be like, wait. It was a detour. It was a detour. Were you an attorney? <laughs> wait, it did was, you go to Harvard? No, it, was, <laughs> it, was a, it was a brief detour and it happened for a couple of reasons. One, I was a people pleaser and growing up, as a girl, a good girl, good Jewish girl on Long Island, you had to be a doctor, a lawyer, or marry one. Mm. And so there's that. And then I was married to a lawyer and he wasn't very nice to me, but he was nice at the beginning. So not knowing anything about abuse cycles, I thought, how and why did this happen? And how can I fix it back? Because I can't tell anyone about it because shame and blaming myself for everything that was not perfect in my life. So alone in this situation, I had to come up with a solution. And the solution that came to me was this happened because he has a law degree and I only have a college degree. And also he had cheated on me when he was in law school with a, a law school classmate. And he said to me in his defense, you can't possibly understand how stressful my life is the way my law school classmates can. You, you haven't been to law school, therefore you, you just don't get it. So it wasn't that far-fetched. The story I told myself at the time, if I go to law school, I will understand him better and he will respect me more and he will be nicer. So of course I couldn't tell anyone. That's why I was going to law school. My grandfather was like, are you excited about this? Cause I've known you your whole life. I didn't see this coming. You wanted to be a violinist. You're an artist. What's going on? And he, he figured it was pressure for my parents. But again, I've forbidden so many times to discuss my truth 
any truth that wouldn't be suitable for the front page of the New York Times, I should never say out loud. So couldn't say what was going on, just marched off to law school. The surprise was that I enjoyed it more than I expected, and I did pretty well, but my husband did not like that. So he was like, okay, we're getting you out of here. Let's get you pregnant and away from all your friends and family and move you to where I come from. So that's how I ended up living in Ohio and finishing law school as a visiting student. And then I worked for legal aid while I was pregnant. And I didn't have any friends with babies. All of my college classmates were in grad school or working, climbing the corporate ladder. And I didn't know that pregnancy made you so hormonal and vulnerable. So my lack of membrane between myself and my impoverished clients was I was constantly crying, wanting to adopt them or getting really upset with them. It was so emotionally grueling. I knew I couldn't be a parent and go through that kind of emotional turmoil from nine to five or whatever. So I'm like, this, this doesn't make any sense. So I left to have my child and was discovered as a decorative painter when I ordered some curtains and the woman who came to sew the curtain saw what I had painted for my child. And she hooked me up with a designer. And then I was off to the races. I had a thriving decorative painting business, which was a great mom job because it's lots of fun and you work for other moms and you get to go pick up your baby from daycare and nobody questions that as opposed to a law firm. So that was my entire legal career. I worked for the ACLU as a volunteer when I was in law school. And then I worked at legal aid for a minute. Ta-da. So that reminds me of the segment. I think I know you from somewhere. One of your claims to fame could be that someone might've heard you playing an instrument or singing. <laughs> That's true. They you might do that as well. I saw on social media that you had the honor of singing some part in a play recently. Do you remember what, it, what that was about? Five years ago. Five years ago, I played Fraulein Schneider in Cabaret, which is such a, an amazing part. Five and, years ago. Holy yeah, moly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Time goes by so fast. Sometimes. It does, especially when there's a pandemic with no theater. Yeah. The play I did after the, or as we were coming out of the pandemic was a drama, but the musical before the pandemic, super, super, they were both fun in different ways. Oh my God. I mean, I, I love doing accents. I had a German accent in cabaret the entire time. And you're probably thinking, well, of course the entire time, <laughs> but that's because I was one character, a German landlady, but in incognito, I played five different women and one was American. No, two were American and three were British. Yeah. So I had a British accent a lot of the time, which was fun. And I was from West Virginia a little bit of the time. Interesting how you were able to uh, navigate all those accents. Yep. I had a wonderful thing. A wonderful thing happened from being in this play, which was called Incognito. I got a spirit message transmitted by a client. I told you how the client's messages are curated to be valuable to both of us but this was her dead father saying tell nancy this wow. tell nancy yeah tell nancy to take notes during rehearsal pay attention this is going to be very valuable to her in the near future and i thought for a moment am i about to have a big acting career? Am I going to be discovered in, in middle age and play women of a certain age? No, because I was playing adopted characters who were trying so hard to find out their true identity. And the name of the play, if I didn't say it, was incognito. So character identity, memory, secrets, adoption, these were the themes. And 
I, especially as Evelyn Einstein, Einstein, Albert Einstein's adopted granddaughter, who it turns out was actually his illegitimate daughter. She was desperate to get a hold of some brain tissue from the pathologist who did her father's, ostensibly her grandfather's autopsy so that she could do this newfangled thing called a DNA test that they were only doing forensically, but she met somebody who was connected. She just wanted to know who she really was and where she really came from. That was such a big deal a short time ago. And now I see people posting their their little pie charts. Oh yeah, on- I came up with my pie chart recently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, why don't you just do this? Because I've always confused people. My face confuses people about my ethnicity, my face and my body, both actually. And that's been a curious bit of a nuisance all my life. And I was like, let's let's just put this whole controversy to bed. Let me get my boring pie chart and post it on Facebook. It was a huge surprise. And I believe that is why I got the advice to take notes and pay attention because I feel like that being in the play was Spirit's way of guiding me to take this test and find out that my father was adopted and discover half of my family, half of my ancestry, wonderful cousins, things about medical history, just so much insight to who I am. Again, the same theme of self-knowledge through deep investigation. I mentioned it in the book, but it may become another book because there's so much to it. So that came from theater. With your admonition for everyone to write a book if they feel so inclined. Yeah, I think you use the word self-investigation. And I think sometimes we can tell ourselves that we have thought about something, but until we actually put pen to paper, we haven't really, not to the depth of of healing it. Not just pen to paper. I'll go back to uh, telling you about my editor for another minute. She was like the director of an excavation where I would go to her and say, so I just excavated that back corner and I did a great job. I, I uncovered a bunch of things. I brushed and I wiped and I I used my little pick and see, see what I did. Can you see it? It's very good. That's very good. But I need you to keep digging to the next layer and over there, that really deep pile of shit. I need you to dig all the way to the bottom of that pile. I I actually told, I told her this, uh, that I had described this process to my best friend when she asked how it was going with the writing, because pen to paper is just, just spewing what you remember easily, what comes out. And then the excavation that you're forced to do by your editor is where the gold is. That's where you're mining. I know it's a mixed metaphor, but excavating, mining, being forced to dig deeper and answer questions. She kept congratulating me. It reminded me when an energy healer who was visiting from Utah when I lived in Cincinnati congratulated me at the end of her session for being so open to letting my energy shift and to releasing things that when she challenged me to, and I was like, some people resist this. Why, (laughs) why would I not want to get the maximum benefit from this session? I'm doing whatever you tell me, but I am open and I do take instruction. I did as a little tennis student and I did with my spiritual friends when they would pop into my life. And I did with my editor having the humility to take instruction is how I learned the most because I went where I wouldn't have gone on my own, whether it's tennis or therapy or. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's good. I'll just do a a shameless plug for myself. I wrote a short, I don't know what to call it. I think I ended up finding out it's called an autobiographical fiction. 
And so I called it Sandra, a healing reimagining of the babysitter from hell. It wasn't the course of a lifetime. So I was able to just write about one specific chapter in my childhood. I didn't have an editor, which now that I'm listening to you, if I ever write another book, if I ever find another story inside me, I'll definitely go the editor route after having I'll talk to you today. Oh, but I didn't mean to scold you. I didn't intentionally scold you, but yeah, it's a good, <laughs> it's a good idea. We've already mentioned some of the dates of when people can pre-order the book, Instigator of Joy, Becoming My Own Fairy Godmother. That's going to be available for pre-order October 15th on your website. But tell us some more about you and how people can follow what you're making in your own sandbox. So what is that website? It's nancyillman.com. What you'll see is that it prominently features the book, news about the book, how to get the book. And it also links to my mural website and to my astral playdates website. Okay. And as I referenced before, you're narrating your own book, right? Is that yes, going to be I'm available? Recording, I'm recording an audio book. Okay. Is that going to be available on audi Audible or are you yes. just, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. So we can use our Audible credits for that. Exactly. <laughs> I will definitely be doing that. <laughs> well. Yeah, I took a poll of my Facebook friends to see what formats they wanted the book because I, I didn't know if I should bother making a hardcover. I'm so glad I asked my friends. They don't want the hardcover. People really want an audiobook or an ebook. It's convenient. And people love books, but for whatever reason, they don't feel compelled to have mine as a book necessarily. And I'm just thrilled to know that. So I've been recording already. I'm almost done. I've had a blast. One of the- Wait, fun... let me ask, do you do voices for any of your characters? Yeah, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. You know, I don't try to, I'm just thinking about the person and I, and it just, I'm not acting. I'm just telling that my family and I tell stories with a lot of dialogue and we tend to do impressions a little bit. So, oh. yeah. <laughs> so I do, I guess I do voices. My father's in there, my mother's in there, some my, Miriam, the psychic, the famous psychic. I don't know. I don't remember who else, but yeah, some people from my dorm. Anyway, I enjoyed reading it. And the surprise was that the recording engineer, who I don't consider in my target demographic, makes me feel like Scheherazade, April, because he's like, oh, I guess we have to stop. I, I really want to hear what happens next. <laughs> so cool. He's so happy. He's so into it. And he fixed my bike the other day. I bike everywhere I can. So I bike to the recording studio for my sessions. And then I got this bungee cord stuck in my gears because I wasn't aware it was dangling off my bike rack. And he got out all his dad tools and he liberated the bungee cord from the bicycle. And so I texted him saying, thank you so much. I'm so fortunate that you find bike repair so fulfilling. And I also am so fortunate that you find my book so fascinating. He's like, yeah, I'm really into it. So you know, I haven't shared it with a lot of people, only the very, very closest people in my life. And then this random dude who's recording it is just like, what happens next? <laughs> so that's been wonderful. I typically read books on paper, but the exception that I find the most gratifying is to listen to people read their memoirs. I've been doing that for years. I want to hear the emotion of the person who lived this story, not an actor's interpretation of it. So if it's fiction, I want to hear Meryl Streep read it. I just listened to her read Tom Lake. I, I listened to it twice back to back because I was like, I just I just listened to the best movie because Anne Pitch Patchett or Pitch Patchett, is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. I love this woman, but I don't hear her name out loud. So I'm probably mispronouncing it, but I had read The Dutch House and I heard Tom Hanks recorded it. I haven't listened. I enjoyed reading with my eyeballs, The Dutch House and Run and Bel Canto. She has, I don't know, like nine best-selling novels. 
So this amazing author and the most amazing, possibly the most amazing actor of our time telling the story, acting out all the characters, I was just in heaven. I'm painting my Lotus Garden, listening to Meryl Streep. And I missed it so much when it was over. I listened to it again, but I digress. My point was hearing women tell their own story from their heart. Yeah, you can't hire anyone to do that. Nobody should record other people's memoirs. Does that happen? It shouldn't. You know who is also an amazing narrator that I had no clue is Kate Winslet. Mm -hmm. She is incredible. I couldn't believe it. Did she do kids books? Yes. There's a like, okay. does too. I think they both do kids. Yeah. They both yeah. do kids books. So my daughter is now 11 and I, I listen to a lot of kid audio books with my daughter and mm -hmm. I think Audible had one of these uh, Audible originals it's about the weirdies, the weirdies. And Kate Winslet does it. And I'm like, I am awestruck all over again because of this woman's amazing talent yeah. with voices. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, wow, how can, I don't even know how someone can do that with their voice. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Okay. My shameless plug, even though I guess you could say the whole podcast is, my eldest child is an audiobook narrator. So they trained in theater at NYU Tisch, musical theater, drama, Shakespeare. And then all the theaters closed, as you may recall, March 2020. And Penguin Random House offered an, an internship or a, that's not what they called it. But they trained a bunch of young people, actors, to become audiobook narrators so they could keep up with the demand for audiobook narration, I guess. And I think Max has done over 50 at this point. And the first time I heard Max do a book, men, women, old, young, Italian, Jewish, I forgot it was my child. I started imagining like you do, you know, you start imagining what these people look like. And I was like, wait, Max is doing all these voices. It's Myers, Max Myers, M-E-Y-E-R-S. So you can search Max Myers narrates and a whole list of their titles will come up. Max did one of the crayon books and she may be too old for those. She is probably too old for them now. Did she ever do, like, I think Max- It doesn't played, ring a bell. So I don't know what those would be. It's like the day the crayon, whatever. The, there's a series of crayon books. They're very popular with a certain crew. And I think Max played the peach crayon. I did not listen to that book. <laughs> I listened to the most recent one I listened to, which I recommend to everyone. Another thing that I listened to back to back twice is called No Two Persons. I forget the author's name, but the title is about the fact that no two people have the same relationship with a book. And to highlight that the author tells the story of the agent, the publicist, the author, an artist who repurposes the book. She goes to extremes to illustrate the point of how it's different for everyone. All right. So aside from the website, are there any social media handles that you want to throw out there for people to follow you? I'm Nancy Illman on Instagram. I tend to you put my artwork there because Instagram's so visual. And I'm Nancy Carolyn Illman on Facebook. And of course, there's the Joy Posse, which everyone is welcome to join. That's the Dragonfly Hummingbird Joy Posse. It's a private group dedicated to sharing what sparks joy for you because it might also spark joy for someone else. And also it's a reliably upbeat, positive place where you don't have to worry about accidentally being triggered by stuff that's not so happy. And you can be inspired by your daily handstands. <laughs> I've been doing those every day. Maybe I should. They really are good for you. Get a lot of blood to your brain first thing in the morning. My daughter was asking, like, what kind of person is she? And so I was explaining a little, trying to convey the kind of person you are. She's older than me and she's still doing handstands. 
in her kitchen and I'm like kitchen chair, kitchen counter supported handstands. You know, I have 10 seconds to run from the cat condo to the other side of the kitchen and get into an inverted position. And it takes some time. So yes, I rely on the kitchen counter. I try not to judge myself too harshly because I'm not at Nancy level, but <laughs> oh gosh, I, did, I try to make small, small steps for my health when I can. So can I tell you basic steps for starting your handstand practice? Yes. yes. Sit down with your back against the wall, with your legs straight out in front of you and mark where the, your heels are on the ground. And you stand up and you put your hands on those spots where your heels were. Following me? Mm -hmm. So you are, now you're facing away from the wall and your butt is toward the wall. Mm -hmm. Extend a leg so that you are stepping on the wall. Okay. Okay, so you have both hands on the ground, one foot on the wall. Then you just put your other foot on the wall and you walk up the wall. And when you feel like you want to just stretch a little, you extend. So both your feet are, I still have pain in my hand from muralizing. So both your feet are on this wall. This is the wall right here, invisible wall. And then when you feel like you just raise one leg, you can still hold on to the wall with this little foot right here as a foot. And then it looks like you're doing a handstand because you're doing kind of a split, which is cool. And these are your arms. So your arms are down, your legs are up, you are inverted, the blood is going to your head, but this toe, even if it's one toe, is giving you so much security and support, so it's not scary. Okay. And then you put this foot back on the wall and you can walk down or you can jump down, but you're supported the whole time. That's how I suggest you start. I love these handstands. I didn't know I was gonna get a little handstand mini lesson, but this is awesome. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be so much more helpful than what I was trying to do. <laughs> I can't remember how long ago it was, but I'm like, I'm going to do a handstand like Nancy. So you're trying to kick up, which is- It was a disaster. Is, yeah, so, yeah <laughs> kicking up is what my yoga teacher forced me to do when I was too scared to do it. And P.S. she had a concrete floor in her studio <laughs> and I didn't have a good stable base in my arms. So I fell and I really hurt myself and that made me afraid to do handstands. So I love telling people this non-scare, I think, unscary and not dangerous and not risky way to get all the benefits of inversion and the fun. Because it is really good to force blood to go to your head. Highly recommend it. Thanks for the reminder. I only have about seven more minutes before I have to log off, but I want to ask you this because I still like this question and maybe your teachers have changed, but have there been three teachers or teachings in your life that you might share with our audience that they could go research and learn from? That is something that uh, Luke's story in his podcast, he would always end his podcast that way. And I loved it so much because I'm talking to all these people but no one got to where they are without other people influencing them. So what three teachers are you recommending today? And that could be completely different or the same as the three that you recommended as back in, in 2021. I have no idea. I have no idea what I said in 2021, but they were already my teachers. So we'll see. We can go back and see. Dr. Eben Alexander wrote Proof of Heaven. And this book jumped out into my face right when I needed it. It is such a beautiful reminder of the most foundational truths of living a good life. Basically that you are cherished and you are loved and that you are never alone. And the way he discovered the truth of this, I will let him tell you because it's such a beautiful book and I want everyone to read it. So you can read that while you're waiting for mine to come out. And then all the books by Dr. Brian Weiss, formerly traditional psychiatrist, went to some other college. That's what we call Yale. And then he was a textbook author and a professor and the ascended masters were communicating to him through his traditional psychiatric hypnosis patients until... He finally had to tell his wife and then 
published books about it and just come out as a weirdo like us because it was undeniably true. And so I started by learning from him. That's how I met Courtney, our teacher in our hypnosis technique. So I guess, I mean, I should include Courtney. Courtney has connected me to this beautiful practice, to you, to Tessa, to Rita, to this amazing community, this international community of women that look at how we're supporting one another right now in this podcast and in so many other beautiful ways. It, it's enriched my life so much. So that started with Brian Weiss, Courtney. I want to include Miriam, but she would not count herself as a teacher. She always said, I'm not giving you advice. I am merely channeling. Mm. I don't know what I'm telling you or what it means or how, how it's significant to you. You have to figure it out. So I'll say Brian, Courtney, and Eben. Okay, so I found your list from before. It was uh, Brian Wise, Eben Alexander, Eben, Eben, Eben sorry, and then right. uh, Bruce Davis and Courtney Starkey. Amazing. Well, Bruce was my Reiki master who trained me as a Reiki healer. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yes, I'm. I'm the same person. What do you know? Well, this has been amazing. I want to thank you so much, Nancy, for joining me again in the sandbox. It looks like it wasn't so horrible that you never wanted to return. <laughs> it's so much fun. It's so much fun. We should hang out more. We don't have to just do podcasts. Maybe do an exchange of Akashic and um, Astral Playdates or whatever floats your boat. Because I, I really enjoy being with your your face and your energy. And you're just, you're delightful. You're a cool person. Oh, thank you. I'm going to not diminish that. I'm going to accept it. Good. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, anything else you wanted to share before we say goodnight? I guess parting words, really, the, the message I want to share with everyone, whether they read the book or not, is honestly, it's the same message that I got from Proof of Heaven. And all right, I'll put it in my own words. You are worthy of love and you need to start with yourself. You need to practice self-love and have compassion for yourself. One thing I may not say in the book, but I find myself saying to my children who are now adults, and I'm saying this to them quite often because I recognize this in myself as well. Please try to listen to what you say to yourself. And if you wouldn't say it to a friend, then revise it and speak to yourself the way you would speak to a friend. Thank you so much, Nancy, for joining me in the sandbox. Much love. And to you.